Welcome to Pop Culture Retro, which was recently voted the 15th best podcast by the residents of the Golden Years Retirement Community in Boca Raton, Florida. Each show, we'll revisit some of your favorite pop culture memories with insider and outsider perspectives. Now, please help me welcome your hosts, Ike Eisenman and Jonathan Rosen. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Pop Culture Retro. I'm Jonathan Rosen with Ike Eisenman, and today we are thrilled to welcome a fellow Brooklynite and one of the stars of not one, but two of my favorite films <laughs> growing up, The Wanderer and Porky's, Tony Ganos. Tony, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Well, I've been trying to get you on for a while. I'm a huge fan, so thanks so much for doing this. Uh, to start with, I, I got to know, what part of Brooklyn did you grow up in? East New York. East New York. I'm I'm a Sheep's Head Bay boy. Okay. Yeah. So I was reading about you and uh, kind of got you got kind of got into acting almost by accident, right? I mean, you were you were into powerlifting first. Well, I was uh, just a kid, and I was pretty much forced into it by my uncle. Uh, you yeah. know, I uh, didn't really think think much of acting, and I certainly didn't want to uh, be involved in it in any way. And uh, he pretty much made me stop uh, working out and uh, um, go to uh, uh, you know to an audition that came into a gym we were in uh, by you know by complete accident. Yeah. So what? How did that? How did that work out? What did they do? They 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 well, just saw you or? Well, my uncle my uncle used to work out at a, at a place in a village called the Sheridan Square Health Club. It's uh, long gone. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I um, was was staying over his house because uh, the gym I was at was uh, was not uh, uh, you know operating, so he was on vacation. And he said, "Why don't you come down to the house?" And he, he lived in Queens, and he said, "We'll go to Sheridan Square and work out." Somebody from the um, uh, what am I trying to? Uh, what am I? Somebody, somebody from casting in the Wanderers. Yeah. Uh, actually, her name is Lois, Lois Planko. She called up this gym because they were looking for like an 18 year old kid, you know, basically with my description. And the guy that owned the gym, his name was Lenny Russell. These guys are always playing uh, uh, pranks on me because I was the kid. So they were, you know, the older guys. So he, he just hands me the phone, and this woman with a husky voice gets on the phone and she asks me, you know, how uh, uh, how big I am. So I was like, oh boy, okay. <laughs> I just handed him the phone and I walked away. And he's laughing. You know, so I figured this is it. This is a joke. Hmm. So I go back to working out. My uncle I grabbed the phone when he starts talking to this lady and he tells me to uh, uh, get dressed. And I go, well, well, why? And he goes, well, you're going to go to this thing, whatever it is. He didn't quite understand what it was. So I went down to the ASCAP building and uh, I met the uh, a director, Phil Kaufman, and uh, I was asked to do a screen test. I, I was given a script and all that, which I didn't quite you know, understand. And I was asked to do a screen test, and that's pretty much how I got the uh, the role in The Wanderers. Huh. That, that is, that, that's incredible, because nothing like that ever happened to me. I, I had to work my rear end off for, for it. <laughs> well, that's something I had no, I, I had no uh, interest in whatsoever, but my uncle pretty much, you know, it, it, you know he was... Uh, Pretty imposing figure. So if he, he you know, um, he had a mind to, to get me to do something, he's probably one of the few people on earth that could do it. So I, uh, I obeyed him uh, un, un, unquestionably. You know, right. <laughs> uh, so that's that's pretty much what happened. So you you basically had no formal acting training, training and 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 no. Now you're doing this film, I mean, were you, were you nervous? How did you um, how did you approach it? No, I wasn't nervous. I just went and did. I just once I learned what what uh, the marks were, and uh, I was a little bit annoyed my first day because the uh, the director, you know, director of photography and the camera people were snapping uh, slates in my face, and I didn't understand why they were doing that. And uh, Michael Chapman, who's probably one of the greatest uh, uh, DPs in the history in the you know in history of film, he walked up to me like I was two years old, and he had to explain it to me. He okay, he says, "This is 
why we uh, uh, click this thing. We're doing a close shot, see, so it's right in your face. That's why we have to hold it up right close to you like that. And uh, we're trying to sync sound to film. So the way we do this, you explain the whole process to me. In fact, I was two years old and I felt like an idiot. So, you know. <laughs> well, it's, it's I very dis- kind of, I didn't have any problems. Just, huh? Yeah, yeah, it's very disorienting if you don't, you don't understand what it is. I mean, that's one, that's one of the first questions when I, I had people come to the set to visit me when I, when I went on a project and they would see all this stuff happen with this clap and this left thing that's right in your face. Isn't that distracting? Is What is that for? And you, you do. I mean, it's not, it's not terribly, terribly, um, terribly, terribly obvious. That's, 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 that's. <laughs> well, that was my first day when that happened. Uh, also, yeah. That was my first day. Yeah. So I didn't understand, you know, I, I, it was a close, it was a close up, but I didn't understand what, why he needed to do that right in my face. So that right. Got me a little yeah, yeah. When, I, when it was explained to me, like I was two years old, I felt stupid. So, oh, man. <laughs> that was it. I wasn't nervous or, you know, I didn't get nervous or anything like that. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun. But so, were so, you aware, oh, I'm oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. No, were, you, were you aware who Kaufman was? Because he had already done Invasion of the Body Snatchers at this time. No, I wasn't aware who anyone was. I wasn't aware who Michael Chapman was or Phil Kaufman or any any of these people. I had I, I had no idea. No. Wow. wow. I just so, came on this set. People were asking me, uh, what, what, you know, where did you study? And I told them, well, I, I you know, I went to I told them my high school I went to. I don't know what the hell they were talking about. <laughs> and they were looking at me really strange. And they go, well, you know, who's your agent? I didn't know what an agent was. <laughs> oh, my God. God. So Philip, Philip yeah. obviously realized you, you you didn't have any experience. How 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 did he direct you to you and, and work with you on your preferred performance? Well, Phil has a unique ability to size up each one of his actors. He he gets to know what the actor's personality is like, and he he delivers uh, a direction according to it. So he would just give me, you know, he'd give me very simple, very simple direction. And uh, I remember when I did the Rising Sun with him, he, did, he gave me, he said something I'll never forget. He said to me, Tony, do what you just did, but don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> now that doesn't make any sense. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a paradox. But he, but I knew exactly what he meant. So he would take an actor like Linda Mance. You know, he knew exactly what made her tick, and he would give her, uh, he would just say the right things to her to get the, uh, you know, performance he wanted. And that's one of the unique things about Phil, Phil Kaufman. You know, he knows his actors, and he, he knows what it takes to get the right kind of, uh, of performance from them. Yeah, I love The Wanderers. Uh, it's, you know, such a great movie to me. That, that, is it true that members of the, the real Baldies showed up during the filming, like threatening? Well, this is what happened. We were in a, a Bronx neighborhood and a bunch of local hoodlums showed up claiming to be the Baldies, like it was some, you know, like revered international fraternal organization like the Knights Templar. They were just trying to shake down the production. Well, wow. whether they were in the Baldies or not, I mean, if if they were the Baldies, uh, it would they would they were pretty uh, a decrepit <laughs> by that time. I used to be. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I stopped on the subway. Somebody walk up to me, go, "Well, I was in the Ford and Baldies." And I was like, uh, "Okay, <laughs> like, what, what, what am I supposed to do now? What do you want me to salute you, or I, I don't know, you know?" Uh, oh wow. wow. From what I understand, uh, the Florida Baldies got shot up pretty bad in 1954 by the Harlem Red Wings. Oh, wow. In Orchard Beach. I don't think there was a whole lot, you know, I don't think they were exactly like the uh, the um, the Marine Corps after that, you know? <laughs> man, man. So, so Ken uh, Wall... But that did so, happen. Huh? So sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no. I was going to mention Ken Wall and... Kellen, Kellen, uh, Karen Allen were also in, and it's are there were there any memorable behind the scenes scenes stories regarding them? Oh, uh, there's all kinds of st- there's all kinds of stories. I mean, we you know, I mean, so much stuff happened on that movie. Uh, all kinds of crazy stories. You had really good bunch of actors. You had you know, Ken Wall, Jim Youngs, Alan Rosenberg, Karen. You know, I mean, all these people were were, were incredible. Dolph Sweet, who has has, has passed, Erwin. 
Erlen Van Lydis to Judah, he was an amazing guy. He was, uh, he's the guy that played Terra, right? Mm-hmm. The big, the big uh, uh, guy in the Baldies. Mm-hmm. He, uh, he was an MIT graduate, and what his, his job had been before that was designing uh, computer systems for banks. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. So many people know that. I mean, if you look at him, his, his, his appearance belies his uh, uh, intelligence, you know? Right. Wow. There, the, the, speaking of him, I mean, the, 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 leave, the leave the kid alone scene has become sort of iconic, and you were so good in it. I remember seeing it as a kid, and I, I was thinking, like, this is the coolest guy I've ever seen. So you had several... <laughs> It was like it was made such an impression on me. I think at the first time I wrote you, I, I mentioned that. But um, you had several fight scenes in the film. How how difficult are those to do? Well, I mean, I didn't. You know, I I uh, I, I had to be shown how to throw stunt punches, which is something I never done. Uh, I, I've never done before. And uh, and my first day was the first day that I worked. I did that scene in the alley. That that you know, leave the kid alone thing. And, uh, you know, there was a lot to learn on the first day. And I, but it, it was in a, uh, it was in a little, like a, I can't describe what it was. It was like a, like a walkthrough through these apartment buildings, you know, and like little windows on the ground floor. And I accidentally pushed one of the actors through the windows. I got excited. He went through the window into somebody's apartment. Oh gosh. So that was the. I just kind of lost control. Uh, yeah, I lost a little control of myself. I got, you know, excited. And, and it's it's hard to do a fight scene sometimes because you, you know, you want to look good, but you also don't want to hurt hurt right. the other actor. And uh, it's it seems to work out better when you're, when you're uh, working with a stuntman instead of an actor. Because if you're working with an actor, everybody wants to look good. The stuntman's job is to keep you safe. Right. And make you look good. So he's not interested in what how he looks. He's interested in, you know, so you 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 know what get get excited and you know, that was my first day. <laughs> but hit hit so, the guy, but don't hit the guy. <laughs> well no, that's no that was done completely I mean, that was done completely by accident. I just got <laughs> excited and I just moved forward and, and the guy went through a window. And, you know, it was funny right afterward. He the guy the guy climbed out of the window back onto where we were and you see this little hand move the shade and you see this little eye peek out and it sees all these guys and then the shade goes goes back really quickly and that was it you know I, I really wonder what the person thought and lived in that apartment so um, oh my god i can't yeah, yeah I, 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 I can't imagine so the the, the movie will leaves theaters for a day or two before being pulled and when you when you see something like that at I mean, after you've worked on it for for song and then being pulled from theaters, I just you know you know make your heart sing. Think. Well, I mean, we didn't know what was happening. We found out later that uh, the the um, uh, the Warriors, which uh, was another uh, gang film, uh, had just been out, and there was some trouble in the theaters. Like there was some uh, violence and attacks, and uh, the uh, uh, producers at Warner Brothers were. A little bit low to get behind the wanderers they were afraid the same thing was going to happen so they the, the film wasn't in the theaters very long but in uh, uh 2016 the film was re-released uh, across the country and uh in some places it was in the theaters for uh, uh two weeks mm. so we had a big opening in in, in in 2016 than we had in 1979. Wow. <laughs> amazing so I, you know, I never saw it in theaters. The same thing. I, I only saw it when it was on cable, and it was like on cable all the time in the '80s. You know, and that's when it, I think it discovered this huge cult following. Did, do you kind of get a sense then, when it was on cable, that this film was gaining new life? Uh, well, I, I had heard about people began to remark about it because in, in New York, I remember there was a thing called the uh, the Z Channel. Right. Yes. You know, before HBO and all these, there was a thing called the Z Channel, and people saw it on the Z Channel, and I began to people began to remark about them about the film. So I guess somebody was seeing it, and uh, through the years, it uh, uh, they, they, they attempted they were, they were going to re-release it in the '90s, and uh, you know Warner Brothers, and then something happened, and then they, somebody there, there's an outfit called Kino Lorber. It's like a film. Uh, a film house, you know, they buy all these older, older titles. 
Right. Uh, they got the rights to it. And uh, <clears throat> they got a lot of the actors and Phil Kaufman and everything to do uh, a um, like a like a special features thing. It was added to the film. Mm-hmm. So the reason these are the people that put it back in the theaters. And the reason they did that was to advertise the release of the new Wanderers uh, DVD and uh, a Blu-ray. Mm. So that's what's done. You know, you know, it's very funny. Uh, uh, I just did an autograph show with uh, with the Warriors. Oh. And I was talking to one guy about that because they know they know that their movie came out first. They pretty much wrecked our movie. You know? oh, well, <laughs> so, well, but I mean, it's not it's not anybody's fault. But that's that's just that's just what happened. You know. <laughs> A, a rivalry between two gang movies. That's kind of fascinating. Well, there is, there is really a rivalry. These guys are these guys are great guys. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, you know, people are people are weird. They'll argue uh, one movie's better than the other. They're actually the the. I mean, the, the two movies have nothing to do with each other. They're completely different films. Sure. You know? Which happens so frequently in Hollywood. It's like, it's like yeah, a certain style film will come out, and another studio studio will jump in and 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 and, and want to make something in that in that set same scene. It's uh, it's really kind of a fascinating thing to. You. So so why do you have such a uh, still such a large following? I'm sorry, would you say that again? Oh, I said why why do you think it still has such a, a large following? Well, I guess there's something in the movie that uh, that uh, you know gets people. The the characters in the movie, there are a lot of larger than life characters in the Wanderers, you know. Mm. Um, and, and it's just something that strikes a chord in people. It it was popular, I guess, for the most part in the in the northeastern part of the country, you know. But then uh, you get people in California that seem to have liked the movie, and you know, you hear different in different parts of the country people. I've seen it. I don't know. It's just one of those kind of things. Mm. It wasn't your uh, traditional. Uh, wasn't your uh, a traditional gang movie? I guess. You you and Ken Wall uh, throughout the years still. Yeah, we we've uh, yeah we've uh, everybody Jim Youngs everybody has remained uh, remained together. That's great. So, yeah. so your your next film you're in Continental Divide with Belushi John Belushi and Blair Brown. Written by Lawrence Kasdan, who had already written for Empire Strikes Back and Raiders. Directed by Michael Apted, who had already done Coal Miner's Daughter. How did you get involved in that? And because it's such a different role than Perry in The Wanderers. And are you thinking like, wow, I can't, I can't believe I'm with all these people now? Well, actually, my, my next film, I, um, I did, uh, um, I had a, a part in, um, geez, I'm trying to remember the film, Sally Field, Tommy Lee Jones. Um, uh, Backroads. That was my next film. Oh wow! Okay. Mm. And uh, the uh, um, uh, director was a, a gentleman named Martin Riff. And I, I was with the William Morris Agency then, and they they sent me in to read for uh, a role of a boxer, like a like a uh, kind of has been boxer. I was only nineteen years old. Hmm. So when I got the size, they just gave me the size. I got the copy. I didn't know. I studied the lines, and I went in. I had to read for the director, and he, I, I you know, walked into the room, and Martin Rick got all disgusted, and he's like, "Ah, oh, no, not another one. God damn it!" You know, I was like, "What the, fuck? <laughs> the fuck this guy's problem?" You know. <laughs> so I had whatever I had in my hand. I just chucked it at him, and I, I was getting ready to walk out. You know, and he goes, "Hold on a minute." So I got, I turned around, I looked at him. And he took the time to explain to me what happened. He says, like, I didn't mean to come off that way, but this is what we've been having problems. People are sending us the wrong. So I started talking to him, and he uh, he put me in the film anyway or something else. Huh. <laughs> and that was interesting. I got, you know, and then I did, uh, yeah, then I did uh, Connell Divide. And that came by accident, uh, you know, you know, purely by accident. I got to meet Michael. After and John John Belushi, and John mm-hmm. John liked me, I guess, which is which helped me get uh, you know helped me get the part. And Michael Apted, you know, is a very distinguished English director. Mm-hmm. And we were in Canyon City, Colorado. We were flown to the set every day in uh, uh, helicopters. Uh, that was very interesting. And yeah, I, I had some idea of who uh, Lawrence Lawrence Kasdan was by that time, and there was a great director of photography, John John Bailey, 
that worked on that film. He was one of the all-time greats. He worked on that. Uh, he, he was on that film. It was it was uh, it was an interesting experience out in the woods. You know, uh, mm-hmm. I did something where I was supposed to. Uh, there's a scene with me and an elk. Um, I will never do that again. <laughs> that was pretty stupid. You know, I didn't really know what an elk was. You know, I just figured, well, an elk's like a big deer, right? Okay. So I'm reading the script. You got to, you know, have to go after the elk, uh, you know, you know, bulldog. And I was like, yeah, okay, no problem. So I'm in my room the day before, and I'm watching this wildlife show, and I see this elk just picks up a 600-pound grizzly bear and throws it in the air. I was like, oh, shit. You know? <laughs> I get down to the set, and the uh, they had a wrangler, you know, an animal wrangler. And I asked him, I said, let me ask you something. What's the story with this elk? Is it like trained? And he goes, no. He says, you can't train an elk. It's too stupid. I go, oh, okay. So, well, this thing weighs 900 pounds. Why is it going to run from me? <laughs> he said, well, it's not too smart. He said, you, you do this, you know, go at it. And he's, he's basically giving me these instructions. Now, the director and the camera crew are up on this boss. You know, they're completely safe. They have coffee and, and donuts and everything. You know, and I have a little microphone in my ear, and the director's going, go get him, Tony. Yeah, right. Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. I, like, I run at the elk, and for some reason, the elk breaks and runs. You know, so I, I wasn't going to try to bulldog the elk. That was that was sh- sheer idiocy. So they tried to get, you know, they got the elk back, and then it took a while, and then we did another take. And uh, uh, at some point, the elk got stuck in the mud. There was like a little river there, and the elk turned and started waving its uh, its antlers. And the um, the animal wrangler is like behind one of the trees. He says, "Okay." He says, "Just back away slowly." He goes, "Don't turn around." He says, "Just take some steps backward." And these guys on the block, go get them, Tony. Yeah, sure. You know, so that was uh, that was interesting. <laughs> oh man! I'll never, I'll never do that again. Yeah, that was that was uh, that was pretty stupid. Oh, good grief! grief. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's like it, I've had my share experiences with animals, both studio trained and and not, and, and it's and, and it's you know, it's just. It, it can be really, 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 you know, um, even with so many people around it to suppose, suppose keep you safe. That's a mass, massive animal. So how is Buzz well, believed? Well, no, this wasn't oh. safe. No, 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 this wasn't safe. This thing weighed 900 pounds. And no, the guy, that's the, guy that I... the wrangler told me to whack. Yeah, the that's, rack that's, alone that's a... was 100 pounds. Man. Yeah, because it does and, that's you know, not it was safe. Really sharp. <laughs> this yeah, thing they, they... made hamburger of me of any, <laughs> you know, at, like any kind it wanted to. Oh my so God. that was uh, that was pretty stupid. But I was uh, you know 21 years old, and I figured, hey, I'm invincible, you know. Yeah, of course. Well, so so how's Baloo to work with during? John was a great guy. Mm. I mean, he um, we were we were in this little town called uh, Canyon City. There's really nothing there that uh, it's in, it's in Colorado. The town exists to service a local prison. So all the businesses in the town, for the most part, have something to do with the uh, the penal institution that's there. Mm -hmm. So there was like a little gym, and I would go to work out in the gym, and I'm walking. One day, I'm walking in the snow, and this limo pulls up right next to me, and it's John. And he goes, what the hell are you doing? I go, well, I'm going to this gym here. He goes, well, you know, why don't you tell me? He says, you know, I would have come along with you. You could have used the, the car. They wanted to go to the gym in a limo. So what they did was they arranged it. <clears throat> John was so famous at that time that he couldn't walk down the street anywhere without people mobbing him. Mm. He couldn't go into a restaurant. He couldn't buy himself a newspaper. People would mob him. So he had to get um, permission to use the gym at night. So we went to the gym at night. It was really cool. Huh. And uh, his, one of his bodyguards was a guy named Bill Wallace, Bill Superfoot Wallace. I don't know, maybe you guys heard him. Hmm. He's a martial arts uh, a champion. Oh, wow. Well. Hmm. So we'd all go running at night. John Belushi, Bill Wallace, and me. We'd go running after we worked out in the gym. It was really cool. And, uh, you know, John uh, John was the type of guy, he would he would give you the shirt off his back. Hmm. That's the way he was. Yeah. I've read that. I've read that about and, him. Uh, Yep, he was a good guy. He was just basically at heart. He was a truck driver from Chicago. You know, he wasn't a 
didn't have airs like he was some big movie star or anything like that, even though he was. Right. And uh, he's just a really good guy. Yeah, I've read that many times. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I want to move on now to, to Porky's. And I, I love that film so much. I've seen it so many times, written and directed by Bob Clark, who would later do A Christmas Story. Porky's was one of the first films I remember sneaking into without my parents knowing it. Uh, it's like the grandfather. You know, everybody snuck into this film without paying. You know, I wonder how I made all the money it did. Nobody paid to see it. No, 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 not sneaky. I, you, you bought your ticket, right? But yeah, but I did, I did sneak into the theater, right? <laughs> exactly. But it's well, like, that's just it. How the hell did it make all the money it did? You know, it was. <laughs> if you look uh, at, at uh, you look on the IMDb, it, it'll say the film made about one hundred nine million dollars. That's yeah. not true. That's the, uh, Bob Clark told me himself that it made over three hundred million dollars uh, domestically. And this is it. This was now. There wasn't a foreign market yet for movies for the most part. I mean, you 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 had some market in like uh, the uh, the English speaking countries. Right. For mm -hmm. these movies, but there wasn't the type of foreign market or cable or anything like that that we have today. Sure. So pretty much when they made a film, it's uh, a domestic run. That that was where all the uh, the revenue was going to come from. And back then, the tickets in big cities like New York or Los Angeles were like five bucks. If you went in the, in the you know, the more rural areas of America, the tickets were like two dollars to get into the movies. You know? So three hundred million dollars is a lot of money for basically a four million dollar movie. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. Well, how, how did you? I mean, you see, yeah. I would say you see its DNA on all the later films, like all the you know, like American Pie is like a direct descendant of Porky's. So how, you had the role. Yeah, of those, guys, uh, those guys. Those uh, guys. Uh, uh, Zy Perry. They. They. Those guys. Uh, I met with those guys for something else that I wrote called Daddy's Girls. Okay, and no, and they they. They told me that when they were in college, they did some kind of a paper on, uh, you know, Porky's. Oh, wow. So, yeah, it's a direct, uh, yeah, the, uh, Porky's was the first teen sex comedy. Yeah. Mm. Um, you know, Animal House was real close, but it wasn't about teenagers. Sure. And it wasn't the typical pattern of a teen sex comedy. And, you know, it's funny. When I was doing Porky's, uh, John, John Belushi got a hold of the phone number of the house where we were staying. And he would call us uh, periodically. Oh wow! <laughs> and uh, he gave it. He, the, the, he gave the house where we were staying the name. He gave it uh, the name uh, um, uh, Casa Casa del Puerco. That's what he called it. <laughs> so he would call to see to see how we were doing, you know. And he, he goes, "Well, you know, what are you doing there?" And I go, "Well, I'm doing this movie. It's kind of like what you did in Animal House, but it's like a lot, um, uh, you know, you know, filthier." <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, the original version of Porky's, when the, in its original form, it was rated X. Right. When it was screened, they rated it X. They couldn't release it that way, so uh, they had to cut some stuff out of it to give it an R rating so it could be released into theaters. Um, <laughs> Bob Clark, uh, very few people know this about Bob. Bob created the first, I mean, the first slasher film. Oh, no. Was Black, Black Christmas. Yeah, Bob, very few people know that about Bob. And uh, he had Porky's for a while. He had it in like in the 70s and he was trying to shop it around and nobody wanted it. And the first time I saw it, I was in uh, uh, ICM. My buddy Kenny was with an agent called Sue Mangers. So I was, I would go there with him and he would go to meet with, with me when I went to William Morris. You know, like we would go into enemy, enemy territory, you know. <laughs> so there was an agent there named Michael Black and I hear him yelling. You're like, what a piece of shit. What, who the hell would make this goddamn thing? Blah, 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 blah. And so I walked in the office. I'm like, Michael, what's going on? And he goes, look at this, look at this shit. You know, he hands me, he hands me the Porky script. So, <laughs> I don't know. I just kind of looked at it and I handed it back to him. And that was the end of that. And I go to the Connell Divide and I get a phone call. And um, they wanted to see me when I got back to LA uh, about this thing called Porky. So I don't know. I didn't read. I went to see Bob at Fox. I was the only, I know I was the only one of the lead actors that didn't have to read. Oh, I wow. just walked in and I met Bob and I shook his hand and that's it. I was hired. You hired on the what spot? Bob later told me was that, huh? You were on the spot hired? 
Yeah, well, yeah, well, he had planned for he had planned it. I mean, he oh, he right. wanted he wanted he just wanted to see me and meet me. I guess to figure out that I'm not like a lunatic or something before he hired me, you know. <laughs> so I just went in, you know, I shook his hand and uh, I was hired. And uh, what I found out later was all the characters in Porky's were based on real people, people that Bob uh, uh, knew or uh, grew up with when he was in Florida in the fifties. The only character that was completely contrived was mine. Hmm. And if you notice, my, 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 you know, my character does nothing to advance the plot. It's completely useless as far as the plot goes. <laughs> <laughs> Every, no, I'm being honest. Everybody else's no, character I mean, I mean, needs I, the I, story I, along with Pumbo. I get what you're saying. Does not. Yeah. Oh, my God. And I'm just there. So, <laughs> But, you know, nobody had any idea that the film would. You know, when we were making the film, we were saying to ourselves, there's no way they're going to. They're gonna release this thing <laughs> with the shit we're doing. There's no way, you know. So I just, well, no. you know, I, I left Florida. Uh, you know, I went back to New York, and like I get this, I get this phone call from these guys in in, in L. A. And they're and they're going, oh, you know, uh, hey man, there was a screening in San Diego. People are going nuts, and they're just, yeah, uh huh, okay. Because <laughs> these guys play really bad practice. We, we 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 live in the South, and they played really bad practical jokes on each other. Everybody did. <laughs> You know, Wyatt Knight would do stuff like saran wrap the uh, or the toilets. Oh yeah. You know? Oh god. So, so like you know, you come back drunk in the middle of the night and you try to take a whiz. You lift up the seat and you know what I mean. Little things like that. <laughs> so that house was just. If they filmed what went on in the house, it would have been ten times as funny as what went on in the film. <laughs> believe me. Uh, so I just figured these guys are playing another prank on me. I'm just going to ignore it. And then I keep getting phone calls. So I walk down to the newsstand and I pick up Variety. And it, I'm looking at Variety. I go, well, I, I guess this is true. It, it, you know, it's, it had a really good opening weekend and everything like that. And I, I couldn't believe it. And when it got to the time to make the second like the sequel, they didn't have like a clue. Like nobody was prepared for that. Huh. So they were, you know, they got us in a room at Fox and they were, these writers were asking us, like, tell us funny stories about stuff that happened in high school. And I was like, oh, boy, they don't have a clue. Yeah. This is going to suck, you know? And <laughs> yeah. like it did, it wasn't anywhere near as good. And the third one maybe was a little better, but still, you know, hmm. it was one of those things. So, Porky's, you know, uh, first, well, uh, first, I... the first team plays comedy. <laughs> yeah, I, I got to tell you, I actually remember, remember auditioning for Porky's and, and read the script and thought, I have ab absolutely no idea what this is, is and relate to it in any way. I was totally wrong for, for it. It was for best that I didn't, didn't have any involvement in it. But do you know uh, uh, what other actors were, were up for some of the other parts in the film? film? Well, I know that Dennis Quaid was up for uh, Wyatt Knight's role, and uh, Jim Young, my buddy Jim Young from The Wanderers, he was up for, for the same role. Hmm. Mm. Uh, that's as far as I know. I mean, who else they tried to get? The, the, the person that was really uh, out of place, I would say out of place, but really was a classy lady that didn't kind of belong there was Kim, you know, Kim Cattrall. Mm -hmm. You know, the rest of us were like, you know, we're slobs, we belong here, you know? <laughs> 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 he didn't belong, but she did a really good job. And, and, uh, you know, I mean, it's just one of those, one of those crazy things. The, the reason that I think Porky's did well was it wasn't because of the, you know, the dirty jokes or the naked girls or anything like that. If you look at Porky's and some of the other teen sex comedies that were written, um, the, the characters really loved each other, no matter how much they, you know, uh, ribbed each other and played tricks on each other. You could see that these characters really cared about each other, and and when they needed to, they all pulled together. And the way it was written, it, they didn't they didn't uh, you know beat you over the head with it. Huh? You know, like it wasn't like some Steven Spielberg movie where like you know they're trying to make a film where every, you know we we, oh, we we love each other and we're, no, no, it was very subtle. You know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. the other stuff is just there as a as a, as a backdrop, but people don't quite get that. So when they try to make a teen sex comedy, they go, well, let's make this really filthy. And uh, that's, that's just not what, what it takes. Like Howard Stern, uh, they were, he acquired the rights to Porky's. Right. And uh, I don't know if he still has them, but uh, they were going to make a film like 20 years ago. They never did. They did do some piece of shit called 
pimping peewee and it tanks. Yeah. And the reason it tanks is like if you, you know, if you're gonna do all this filthy crap, why not just make a porno movie? <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. No, I mean seriously, if you're gonna go, if you think that's what made this successful, you're wrong. You're, you're completely wrong. That's not what it. That's not what it takes. Well, pimp, you know, pimp and pimp if you do that, it's gonna fail every time. Yeah, Pimp and Pee Wee is unwatchable. It, I, I saw, I did happen to see it, and I, I couldn't get through ten minutes of it. It was just dreadful, dreadful movie. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, the idea was that whoever, I, I guess, I don't know if it was Stern's group or whoever, but they were. There was some deal made where, in order to hold on to the rights, uh, after a certain time, they had to produce a film exceeding ten million dollars. You know, like, a, and they they didn't with that. They just made a half-ass attempt to make a film to retain the right. Mm-hmm. Now I don't know how Stern still has the rights or who who has them now. But if they try to make the, the film like that, and you don't have a relationship between the characters, it's not going to work. Well, I, it'll I, just be a, another half-ass porno movie. You know, I, that's what they do. Well, I, I think you hit the nail on the head, and I was going to bring that up. To me, what made Porky stand out was the heart. I, on a personal level, I'll say I revisit it so often because at the time it came out, I, I was this Jewish kid from Brooklyn, but going to school in the West Coast of Florida. I got, I got into fights because I was Jewish. So I kind of identified with Brian and that subplot. So while it was a warranty comedy on one end, it did have a lot of heart in it because there was the, a lot of these subplots uh, was, you know, the anti-Semitism, right. standing up to bullies and abuse, you know, by, you know, uh, Tim's father. So it kind of felt different from the other raunchy comedies at the time. So did you get all that when you read the right. script? Well, no, you don't, you don't, you, you, honestly, what happened in my case, I, uh, <clears throat> I had the script, and Bob Clark brought us down to Florida for, uh, you know, rehearsals. Bob believed in extensive rehearsal. And uh, <clears throat> two weeks into the rehearsals, I lost the script. <laughs> so I was never really, you know, and we were just going over parts. But no, I mean, if you read the script, you can see that. But Bob, what makes it cool is that Bob doesn't beat the audience over the head with it. It's like all that stuff you just mentioned is an integral part of the plot. And it's seamless. So when you watch it, it's not like you're going, oh, somebody's trying to get some kind of a message across here. No, he's not. he doesn't do that. It just goes... It blends in with what's happening, with, you know, seamlessly. And you can see all these characters come together because they really care about each other. Right. You know? <clears throat> and that's what made Porky's different from movies uh, where, you know, you just have fart jokes and naked girls, you know? Yes. So, <clears throat> but uh, <clears throat> Bob did a great job. I mean, he, you know, Bob was an interesting guy. He, uh, he's gone now. He passed in t- 2007. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, a lot of that cast is gone. Chuck Mitchell, he passed. Yeah. Um, Nancy, Nancy, Nancy Parsons, a, a wonderful, wonderful lady. She was a sweet, kind lady, just completely unlike her character. You know, she was a a lovely, lovely person. She was a real lady. If you think of a real lady, like 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 Scarlett O'Hara, that's that's the way she was. You know. She she was so fantastic um, in the film too. She, she, you know, it's funny. She usually, if you look at her her filmography, she usually plays like these evil, uh, you know, bitches. Right. But that's completely. The, she was completely the opposite. She was uh, uh, like a lady of the old, the old style. You know, right. she was a gracious, polite, you know, person. You know, she was really, really cool. She was a cool person. And you know, I miss her a lot. Yeah. And- and the chemistry, all of you, I mean, the, the chemistry between all of you was just so fantastic. I mean, did that translate off screen as well? All the chemistry with all, everyone? Yeah. Well, you see, we, we lived in we lived in this one house. Right. One of the actors, Roger Wilson, uh, he got rented us this house on the beach, right, on, on you know, Miami Beach. And we were all put together. We all came from really, you know, uh, a disparate, uh, you know, backgrounds. And... Uh, there was something about us where we all got a kick out of each other, but we came from very different backgrounds. Like, uh, Roger was this really, really rich kid from, uh, you know, Louisiana. And he used to do yoga in the morning. He was in like a diaper and he's doing yoga, you know, eating like, uh, you know, bean shoots or some kind of crap. <laughs> and then you have Dan Monaghan. He was, a, you know, he played peewee. He was an avid golfer. 
So I used to, you know, make fun of him. I, I would make fun of him. I go, why the hell would somebody want to play that stupid game? Hit a little ball around with a stick, you know. And he goes, you think it's easy? I go, sure, it's easy. Anybody can do that. So he takes me out in the backyard. And the backyard was sand because we're right on the beach. He puts a, a ball on the tee, hands me a club. And he says, go ahead, you know, take a, take a whack at it. So I go, well, let's see, Cuba's 90 miles away. Okay. So I take a whack at it. I, I dig like, you know, about you know, 50 pounds of sand out of the out of the ground, and the ball's still there. So uh, I felt like an idiot. I shut up. I handed him the club back, and I walked away, you know. Then we had Mark Harrier. Mark uh, played Billy. He was a very, very intelligent and methodical guy, you know. And he did everything by the book. Like, when these guys got their scripts, you know, they would outline, you know, uh, blocks of dialogue. And Bob gave us these... Uh, scene charts where each of the characters would be and, and how they would move in the scene. I don't understand any of this crap. <laughs> I was like, what the hell is this shit? You know, I, 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 and then people ask you questions like, well, when you did this scene, were you aware of the dynamic of a, what? What the <laughs> fuck are you talking about, man? You know, I don't know what the hell, you know, and anyway, you had all these different characters, Cyril O'Reilly, this guy, you know, he was right next to me, you know, in the house, we shared a bathroom. He's in, he's he's insane. That guy. He's 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 a he's a good guy. He he just just it, it, if they filmed what went on in that house, uh, uh, it was insanity. You know, R Roger would make fun of me because of the you know the way I ate, and I'd make fun of the way of him because of the way he ate. You know, um, Scott did not live with us, and he came he came on to the the, the film Scott Columbia, uh, like about a month or so after we were shooting. You know. But he he already had done um, you know he, he 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 had a lot of experience that none of us had. He he did the series you know TV series one day at a time, a bunch of other stuff. He did a, a Caddyshack. Caddyshack, right? Yeah. By then, yeah. And then Wyatt Knight. I mean, he was like the, the guy was an hysterical guy, but he was like like a devil. You know, he he <laughs> he continuously played practical jokes, did all kinds of shit. I mean, you know, we we would do things like. Uh, Pop the pop the hood of another guy's car. Take the uh, a distributor, uh, you know the a distributor wire, so it wouldn't start. Uh, you know, I mean, all kinds of crazy shit. The people would uh, there were girls in that house. You'd walk into a room. You're stepping over girls that are passed out on the floor. Oh, God. <laughs> you know, you're trying to get to the to the ice box. It, it, it was insane, and uh, that was uh, <laughs> right on the beach. We had that house right on the beach. So. Well, you, you so, kind of... well, Mark Carrier, I gave I gave all the guys nicknames. Mark Carrier, I always called him Joe Joe Correct because he was very smart and he was very uh, you know methodical and he did things very logically. You know, so he was completely you know he, he did everything in a very uh, uh, you know precise way. You know, he made fun of me. I got made fun of by everybody. So. You you kind of mentioned that there that a lot of the things were Bob Clark based it on his own uh, real life experience. Were you were you ever told yeah. which ones? <laughs> and no, we, we you know we had we had a we had a running consensus as to who Bob actually was, and we we came to the conclusion that Bob was Pee Wee. <laughs> Bob Bob vehemently denied this, but that that was that was and remains our. <laughs> Our uh, guest, uh, and he, he he denies it. Now, there was a club in 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 Florida called Porky's. It was out in the Everglades, and mm -hmm. it was around until the seventies. So there was a real Porky, uh -huh. and there was a real club where that kind of crap happened. Mm. That was that was all real. Uh, oh, that's 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 crazy. So I mean, yep. With all these relationships and this fun, fun go between you, was it difficult, difficult to make, you know, a straight, straight face at times on set? Well, I remember when they did the second movie, you know, we were still screwing around like that. And like, you know, somebody, you know, they had, they sent guys from, the, from Fox, from the studio to come to the set. And somebody saying to us, well, you know, you guys have to, you know, straighten up and everything. You got people from the studio here. I go, well, what, why would we do that? You know, we're, what's the point of doing this crap unless we can have fun, right. you know? that straighten up because these guys are here, you know? But, I mean, you know, it wasn't... It was sometimes, you know, when you when you do certain things, it's funny, and, and you, you, it's hard to stop, uh, you, you know, laughing. 
And a lot of that movie was done at night. So Bob would give us direction and, uh, you know, you're not quite like wide awake and do like mm-hmm. stupid things because you're, you know. Um, but, you know, when you try to laugh in, in a scene, I mean, it's something maybe funny the first time, but after a couple of takes, it gets less and less funny. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. So exactly. I, think it's harder to, it's, I think it's harder to try to keep laughing and, and make it real than to, than to try to stop yourself from laughing. But that's just me. No, I have to say to say the, yeah. if people don't you, you think think would be hard? No, really honestly, honestly laughing laughing and 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 to, to do that multiple time multiple multiple takes and different angles is was one of the more challenges for me to do and you guys had a lot of that at, in uh, in the film. Some of these people was just purely funny. Like you, you had an actor Eric Christmas, he played the uh, he was a British actor. He played the uh, the principal he was just a funny man, right. yes. you know. And, and and in my opinion, the funniest scene in the movie is the scene in the principal's office where Nancy Parsons, who played Miss Miss uh, uh, Balbricker, she's pleading with them to, uh, you know, set something up to identify the guy that stuck his dick through the shower. You know? Right. And that yeah. was done in one take. If you look, it's seamless. It was done in one take. There's no, there's no, uh, there's no cutting. Yeah. And the guys in the back, I mean, Boyd Gaines and, and, and this other actor, they're, they're trying to suppress their laughter. That was that was the best, in my opinion, the best scene in the movie, the funniest scene in the movie. Mm-hmm. The tally whacker, right? She's like, uh, like grabbing his hands. Right. She's grabbing his hands. She's like uh, uh, pleading with him, you know? Yeah. And he's like, uh, Miss Baldrick, huh? You know, <laughs> it's just really funny. Uh, <laughs> so, but, so the- uh, there you go. That out and it gets mostly panned and goes on to be a huge success. Like we were saying, it's the number five film of uh, 82. Look at the company. I mean, E.T., Tootsie, an Officer and a Gentleman, Rocky Three, and right in front of Star Trek Two. I mean, is you guys. It's it's incredible that how well it does. So, but I've heard you say that there was sort of a resentment from the movie industry over yes. the success of Part oh, yeah. uh, <clears throat> The industry hated us for the success of the film. They they absolutely hated the actors. For the success of the film, which is really stupid because it's this is a business, you know. Mm. So you, you you have a story like Wyatt Knight, you know, he, he goes in to read for something. Casting director looks at his resume and goes, oh. and she holds it up like a dirty diaper. Oh, you were in <laughs> this this is like he did some kind of like he like he like he committed some cosmic crime, you know. This is this is a, a film. This is a this is you know this is business. You know, and yeah, they they like resented the success of the movie. It's really really crazy. The 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 kids from American Pie they didn't have that. They were they were lauded for their performances. Was well, that that didn't happen once? You know? mm. Different times, right? Amazing, yeah. incredible. Yeah. Well, it's amazing. It's amazing. The people that were doing this are probably the most perverted people on earth. But yet they were they were all shocked. You know, they were morally outraged by the things we did in the film. You know. <laughs> Right. Hollywood being yeah. outraged by someone. <laughs> yeah, oh no, they were definitely. They, they, you know, well, Hollywood. You know, as you know, with its high, uh, you know, moral standards. Uh, right, right, exactly. That's most of the business was completely, was completely outraged by by the by the movie. Yes, it was it was garbage and and uh, who are those guys? I can't, I can't remember their names. Um, uh, Chico and Ebert. Right, right, yes. <laughs> Now, one of those guys, and I don't remember who was who, but one of the guys, who, who was the, uh, the fat guy? Uh, Ebert, Ebert. Okay, he, that, those guys complained, they panned the film, you know, it was a piece of, it was, you know, the work of the devil and all this kind of shit. And then later I find out that guy wrote his own te- teen sex comedy, and it, like, failed. So, <laughs> what does that tell you? Yeah. <laughs> Well, well, did all yeah. did all affect you negatively, or, or did did did, you, did the success of the film film um, bring about some some changes in your life? Uh, well, uh, not, not, I, I, don't, I can't really think of how it, it it really changed my life. I mean, it uh, people, I guess, knew us, you know, because of the film, but I don't think it changed changed my life very much. No. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, yeah. You, still, you still keep in touch with everyone from the cast or no yeah everybody yep yeah, still keep in touch with all these guys yes definitely 
That's great. We have uh, Cyril O'Reilly and myself are doing it. We we put together a film called Daddy's Girls, which is uh, about a bunch of ex Playboys uh, that are paid back for all their philandering by having to raise teenage daughters. Now, so originally, I, I when I did this, we, we, yeah, we 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 almost got the financing a bunch of years ago, and then at, at the last minute, something something happened, and we weren't able to complete the financing. But the original idea was to have all the Portons guys play the fathers. Now, the film has nothing to do with Portons, right, right. But that was the original idea. So by now, if we do it and we do use the guys again, it'll be uh, maybe uh, a granddaddy's girl, you know, because we're uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> getting a little long in the tooth. So uh, if we still do it, but yeah, Cyril, uh, you know, we we've had this film, and uh, you know, we're, we're, let's uh, we're, we're we're trying to get it made again. Let's let's see what happens. Do, are, well, I mean, several of you have already done the fan circuits. Are there any plans for any future cons at all? Uh, at the moment, uh, you mean uh, autograph shows? Yeah, yeah. Uh, right now, I just did one uh, about two weeks ago in uh, Jersey. So, uh, but at the moment, no, not that I'm aware of, no. Mm -hmm. well, it still uh, has such a huge fan base. How, how often do fans fan uh, uh, out to you? I'm sorry, would you say that again? It, it, uh, it, uh, it broke up. Oh no, no, that's right. I mean, it was just saying, saying that it still has such a huge fan base, and how often do fans uh, uh, reach out? Well, I mean, people, you know, you, people. I the only social media I have is that Twitter account, and I get, you know, people reach out. They make comments about the films and stuff like that, you know. And uh, uh, people, people seem to like Porky's. <laughs> and you know, even they, still, it's retained. No, I mean, it's it's it's. Yeah. You realize it's a it's a it's a 40 year old movie and people right. still remember. And I guess some of the younger people are seeing it because you get young kids that saw the movie and are going, that are talking about it. And how the hell, wait a minute, how the hell do you even know what this is? You know? Right. And they're laughing, you know, we saw this, blah, blah, blah. You know, I guess maybe the, 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 the parents or their, uh, or their grandparents made them see the movie. You know, I don't know, <laughs> but it's retained some of its popularity. Um, okay. But it is the father of the teen sex comedy. All the other teen sex comedies that came afterward, or whatever they whatever they did for good or ill to uh, the Porkies. Man, and, absolutely. Uh, I don't think you're gonna. I, I don't think you're gonna make this film again. It's one of those kind of films that I don't think you're gonna. If they try to make it again, I don't think it's gonna work. Uh, yeah. Bob got lucky. He, he caught lightning in a bottle with the cast that he had. You know, I'm. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, I'm blowing the 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 a collective horn of the cast. Right. You know, he, he got really really lucky. He had some really good actors and some funny funny guys, and everybody came mm -hmm. together. And it was the time and place to Miami in the early '80s. You know, I mean, it was just one of those kind of things. It's lightning lightning struck. You know, you, you, mm -hmm. they caught lightning in a bottle. I don't think it's going to happen again. Or at least if it if it does, it's not going to be easy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I. Well, I I would totally, totally agree with you if a remake were to have happen, probably wouldn't work. But if if that if if it miraculously did occur, you know, would you have you appear it if you were you were asked? Yeah, sure. Why not? I mean, if we <laughs> if we yeah, if they got us to be to do to do little roles in it, just to like give it a, a, a what's the word uh, the cameos? Yeah. Uh, yeah, just just like that as a goof, sure, of course. Yeah, I, I would mm -hmm. do that, but like I could say I, I, I would really wonder. You know, I mean, I don't. In my opinion, the I think you should only remake a movie when you can make it better. Mm -hmm. Like uh, when when they did when Sesame Street made Ben Hur first time, he made it in black and white and it was a silent film. Mm -hmm. And then he made it in color with a widescreen, you know, format and it was sound and and, and it, it was made better. You know, mm -hmm. but just to remake a movie senselessly for the idea of remaking it is like stupid in my opinion. You know, it never mm -hmm. seems to work. They did a, a remake of uh, of uh, a Ghostbusters with women. It, what was yeah. the point of doing that? It wasn't any better. It, it didn't. You know, what, what, what just to make it with women? Well, so what? You know, that was uh, you hit um, it on. <laughs> I, I do want to ask you quickly about a couple of your other roles. I mean, you were you you've met you've been in so many things with that you were like with some 
real heavyweights, like you did uh, Die Hard 2 with Bruce Willis. So how much fun was that to, to work on? Well, it was an unusual film, and it took a long time because for some stupid reason, the production was traveling around the country chasing snow. <laughs> so we were in uh, Alpena, Michigan, waiting for snow, and there was no snow. So we were, we were sitting around a lot, doing nothing. We went to Moses Lake, Washington, chasing snow. And it, we were sitting around. We were like, you know, going bowling. You know? That's what we were doing. Uh, but, uh, it, it, you know, it was a big, big uh, a production. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm I, doing this fight with Bruce Willis, and I have like a, like a hunting knife. Mm-hmm. And some, you know, some very intelligent person decides, well, wait a second, that's very dangerous, and Bruce can get hurt if he slips. So they try all these different knives, right, to 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 like uh, make the scene safer. So they gave they gave me a uh, like a like a rubber knife, and the, the the blade was like flopping back and forth, so that didn't work. So then, in a stroke of genius, somebody pulls out a the same knife but with an aluminum blade. Now the blade is razor sharp, but that doesn't matter. It's aluminum. So that's how, that's what we wound up doing. Bruce uh, uh, trusted me, you know, but that was some of the grand thinking that went into that movie. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, well, you know, it was, it was, it was fun. We were in a place where it was, uh, uh, it was like uh, 20 below zero. when we did a lot of the, that stuff. Some of the stuff was done in the studio in Los Angeles. Um, it was an all-star cast, you know. I mean, you had a lot of big actors in it. You know, Franco Nero was in it. Yeah, it was. It was. It was very interesting. You know, and, very interesting movie to do. And, and speaking of all stars, I mean, you you reunited with Philip Kaufman on Rising Sun, written by Michael Crichton. You were basically reprising your role from Wanderers. I mean, the matchsticks chewing tough guy named Perry. Was that was that explicitly yeah. stated to you that it would be the same character, or just just like you know? No, 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 no. Philip Kaufman. No, I, I had heard <clears throat> I had heard Phil was in Los Angeles. Uh, Phil uh, eschews Los Angeles. He doesn't care for it. He's up in San Francisco, mm-hmm. so he's in town and he's casting this movie. I just went to Sam, uh, you know, say hello, and he says uh, he just hands me script and he says, "Okay, he says you're in this film," and I go, um, "Okay." You know, <laughs> he didn't tell me anything. And when we get on the set, he he they they actually had some kind of a search going to find me a match. It was like this for set wide search. So that was his idea to, uh, to 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 put that character in it again, you know. And it was just a subtle thing. He has somebody call me Perry and he has me with the match. So that's that's in other that's his in 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 Phil's, you know, way of thinking, that's what happened to that character <laughs> when he left New York and wound up in San Francisco, you know. That's, but um, very few people will get that. It's just a subtle thing. If you get it, fine. And if you don't, it doesn't. It doesn't matter. You know? yeah. uh, Sean Connery. Wow, what a what a cool guy, man. That was wow. That's Sean Connery. You know, just just amazing. You know, that's that's exactly Next man. You know, he uh, <clears throat> well, he had some kind of a beef with the with the director of photography, Michael Chapman, and they would like you know they would argue you know uh, continuously. <clears throat> Sean Connery was like the executive producer, so if he wanted to, he could have fired, probably fired Michael, but you're not going to get a better, uh, you know, DP anywhere. So they both respected each other, but they they, you know, they argued a lot. <laughs> well, that's cool. I... And nobody quite knew what to do. You know, these two guys are yelling at each other, <laughs> and everybody's like really quiet. You know, nobody knows, you know, everybody's tiptoeing around when they're, when they're yelling, you know? So, no one wants to get in between. One of those kind of things. Right. <laughs> yes. Huh? What? Said, no, no one wants to get in between a beef with Sean Connery and anyone. I guess. No, no, nobody wants to get. <laughs> nobody wants any part of that. Nobody wants any part of that. They just let. They just let like it. They just let the whole thing blow over. Like Michael Chapman was annoyed because Connery would come to the set late because he was playing golf. Let's say, <laughs> and like he's the boss. So what are you gonna say? You know, he's it, you know. Yeah, you know, you know, you know, it's like six in the morning, and you know the sun's coming up, and they're trying to get a, a couple of last shots, and he's pissed because. You know, he just, he's not going to have the, the, the light. You know, the light's going to change, and he's not going to be able to do the shots, and he's yelling at Connery, making it even worse, and Connery's yelling at him. And it was a lot of fun. You know, it's funny. Um, his Connery's wife and son had heard about Porky's. That, that like, shocked me. 
Oh, wow. He didn't know what it was. <laughs> but he told me, he says, no, you're, you're in a movie called Porky's. You know, like, I was like, yeah, well, yeah how, how, how? it just freaked me out. Like, how, how would you know about stuff like that, you know? And, uh, I, I, um, uh, when I spoke to him, I was told, uh, don't talk to him about Bond movies, you know, because it's, it, it's like annoys him. So I didn't, but I did ask him. Uh, what his favorite film was of all the films that he made, and he said it was the man who would be king. Oh. Mm. That's what he told me. Mm. So that was very interesting. I had not seen the, the the film. I went out and got it and saw it. it was it was a, it was a good film. He made it with uh, Michael Caine. Yeah, great film. But that was his favorite movie. Yeah. <laughs> well, he, he was a big, big, uh, you know, powerful guy. He was sixty six years old. We did that. He was in really good shape. He was. A lot of people don't know this, but he was a uh, he was a bodybuilder when he was younger. He was like yeah. Mr. Scotland or something. Right. And, yeah. Uh, he, 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 got, he kept himself in good. Yeah, he kept himself in really good physical physical condition all of his life. Huh. Yeah. Well, you 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 talked about the movies there. I do want to talk about your Twitter account. Your your Twitter account is fascinating to me. I I love I, I I do I love it. I I, I like it a lot of times. I don't know if you notice it, but. I love your content. You have a lot of military history, which I read later that you're an expert in, as well as a lot of classic Hollywood content. So like one day I might see something on the Battle of Carthage and the next something about Sheldon Leonard or Myrna Loy. So because your knowledge is, is both very impressive. Well, you know, I, as of late, I've stopped writing this stuff because it's like I write, I write, I write this thing about how uh, you have a... a um, um, the hell's his name? Eratosthenes, right? He discovers the, the he he figures out the circumference of the earth, right? Okay. So I wrote this complex thing. The man had a stick and he had a shadow when he figured out the circumference of the earth. And he was he was like five hundred you know, five hundred miles of the actual circumference, you know? And nobody seems to care. But then you see a guy posting a picture of a dog licking himself, you know? <laughs> and like that gets like a million likes. So, you know, what am I doing here? It's just no, like I'm wasting my fucking time. I, I, I don't think you, you should. Nobody cares. <laughs> I, lo yeah. I love the content when you post that, when you post that stuff. I mean, you. Well, thanks. I, I, you know, I really appreciate it. At least somebody's reading it because I, I, you know, I, I see the stuff people post. Hey, look, my girlfriend has one tip bigger than the other. <laughs> Here's the picture, you know. And that gets really, you know, so you can see the kind of, you know, the mentality of people on there. It's like, you know, I, well, you know, what am I doing? Why am I, why am I doing this? You know? Uh, well, I, so, I think, you, like I said, I think it's incredibly fascinating. I, you could probably be doing lectures or writing books on this this content because I mean, your your knowledge is so impressive. So I, I got to ask, which is some of your favorite historical periods? Because I am a big history buff as well. Really? Okay. Well, I like uh, I, I can tell you what I know about. I know the most about uh, uh, the classical era in Europe, uh, Greece and Rome. I know a lot about I know a lot about the Persian Wars. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Byzantine Empire and the Dark Ages in the West. I uh, I actually got to work on a film. Uh, it's not done yet, and it has no name. But I was a uh, a technical consultant mm -hmm. on uh, the uh, decline of Rome. And what I did was I pretty much checked out the stuff these guys had, which was kind of funny. You know, they had all these uh, 19th century uh, drawings by um, what was that guy's name? Um, Oh, he's famous. Oh, God. I can't think of his name. Um, there are these drawings in the 19th century, these ink drawings of what people thought people in that period of time looked like, you know, and it's completely wrong. Like, you see, like, Vikings with horn helmets and stupid shit like that, you know? So I'm looking at some of the stuff these guys paid for, and I'm laughing. You know, it's, <laughs> you get this crap. You know, this is, this, this doesn't, and they're like, well, what are we, what are we going to do? We pay for it. I go, well, why don't we just do this? Let's, Let's use the pictures and then comment about what's wrong with them, you know, and so that this way at least they're not thrown away. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, I like, uh, you know, the Dark Ages in the West. Mm -hmm. uh, I like the uh, the Crusades, like the different, uh, you know, military orders. You hear all this crap about the Knights Templar. You know, it, it, it's really stupid. They make so much shit about the Knights Templar. And they say stuff like they found the Holy Grail and the, the Ark of the Covenant. I mean, th th these were these men were illiterate. Okay, now you're looking at the uh, the uh, the Temple of Solomon. But what's left of it up on the Temple Mount? You figure from the time Solomon was alive, about a thousand BC, it's two thousand years later. Do you really think anything would be 
underneath it in the stalls that somebody hasn't, uh, you know, gone through. <laughs> and, then, and then you have a bunch of illiterate men. So they're going to pull out things about uh, navigation and about space travel and, they're, and, 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 and the Holy Grail. And they're going to know what all these things are. You know, that, it, it's just a little un, unbelievable to me. Well, like but I, I they were, um, by you and your content with this. I really am. Well, I, you know, I tell you something, it's interesting to know that, that actually somebody read this stuff. I just figured, you know, I'm writing this stuff for like, what, 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 why am I writing this? This is like, you know, nobody's <laughs> reading this crap. I just get tired of it. It's like, you know, let's do me. this, man. <laughs> huh? Well, I'm, 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 I just did it with the autograph show I just did. I had a couple of people come up to me and they said, hey, how come you stop writing this stuff? And I told them basically what I just told you. <laughs> You know, and they would say, no, no, we like this. <laughs> okay. I don't know, but I, I just, uh, it, it's it's just a lot of work. I mean, I, 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 you know, you explain to somebody in a few blocks why, uh, how, uh, you know, uh, uh, Eratosthenes discovered this, the, the, uh, the circumference of the earth, or you describe a war, you know, like what happened to, with a, you know, with, with, with a war, the outcome of a war. Uh, you talk about ancient Rome, you talk about, you know, just uh, all that stuff. My knowledge of history kind of tapers off after the 17th century. Have you, know, have you been doing I, like I kind of, lectures on this? Have I done lectures? Are you sure? <laughs> no. You, I read that you were like really like an expert in these periods there. So I, like, I, I didn't know if you wanted to get well, I, I, well, I mean, an expert, I, 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 I'm just the guy that studied this stuff a lot. You know, when I was a little kid, uh, my dad, you know, he, he worked at night and he would come home late. And when I was five or six, he would open up these books. He would read books as he ate. You know, my mom would leave him food and he would warm up the food. And I'd get up because I would hear him come in. It was the only time I, I got to see my dad. Right. So he would do things like he would take like a butter dish and two uh, two salt shakers. And he would show me how the uh, uh, Macedonian phalanx worked. I'm, I'm you know? am- amazing. <laughs> That's great. And then he would talk, he would explain to me about the Battle of Thermopylae and about the Persian Empire. And he explained to me about the movements of troops. And, you know, uh, he, he told me all this stuff. He told me about, um, you know, you know it's a, a funny story. Um, you know, the movie The Warriors, right? That was based on, uh, you know what um, um, uh, a novice is? No. Go- Have you ever heard of it? No. A novice was a, uh, like a work, a treatise written by a guy named Xenophon. He was an Athenian uh, gentleman of like the fourth century. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, it, what it means in Greek is the march up country. So he wrote a, he wrote a, a book. It's the first fully chronicled military expedition of all time. Huh. And uh, it was it's about a, a king actually a prince that hires a group of Greek mercenaries that were the best in the world after the other Peloponnesian War to go into Asia to help him fight his brother, who was the king of kings. And they win the battle, and but the guy that paid them died, right, dies. So now you have an army of Greek mercenaries, 10,000 Greek mercenaries, and they have to figure out how to get back into Greek, into Greek territory while keeping their leadership intact, and they're attacked, you know, they're, they're attacked by all these different factions within the Persian Empire. So somebody read that, and in 1962, they wrote a book called The Warriors. Amazing. Amazing. And they, they turned, the, they turned the, the Greek mercenaries into a, uh, a Puerto Rican gang in New York City. <laughs> and when, when they made the movie, it's completely different. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, Michael Beck, who was the lead guy in The Warriors, he knew that. He knew about that. But uh, that's that was what the Warriors is based on. That work, that work in Abyssus was so famous that Alexander the Great carried a copy of it with him when he went into Persia. That, see, you know, I might be getting a little too stuff. heavy here for people. No, you should. Huh? Be, you, you should continue your Twitter stuff. <laughs> well, I am, but it's a lot of work, man. I'm, I'm trying to, you know, I'm getting lazier and lazier. That's a lot of work. I'm putting together something, <laughs> or, you know, you know, I, 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 I write, I write some stuff, and like, you know, you. You just, it's not, you know, I don't know, man. It's a lot of work. Hmm. You know, I'll just, maybe I should just find a dog licking himself and take a picture of that. You know, that, that'll get a whole bunch of likes. <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm, embarrassed to say, I'm embarrassed to say that my my dog with any posts at all, and I don't post it. My wife, my wife has, has 
like four times the, the followers that I do on uh, in, uh, Instagram. It's just hilarious. And they just, she, she keeps racking what up post? like what scores, scores every day. Sorry? What did she post that be, that's very, very popular? Just cute pictures of multi poo. She's a six pound white little fur ball, ball and, and, and bog pictures are just the, you know, with a cute, cute caption and, and, and um, I don't, I don't even probably only has 20, 20 things posted and she's got like two, two, 2000 followers. It's crazy. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, you could post a picture of a cat with a little hat on and people love yeah. that, you know, and, yeah. and uh, now there's a, there's a friend of mine in LA that he, he likes to cook. He's, he, you know, um, and he sends me pictures of like stuff that he's cooked. And I make like comments on the, on the cooking. And I started a little thing about the, the history of some of the Italian, the Italian cooking. I wrote something about, uh, uh, a lasagna, you know, the history of the, you know, the, 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 the noodle, the macaroni, the whole thing that, you know, when, the, when, when the tomatoes came to Italy, you know, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, you know, nobody cares. <laughs> <laughs> It's like nobody, nobody goes, hey, I'm going to go get a pizza. Well, yeah, okay. And the, the guy wrote it for, it's, it's, you know. But it, it's a lot of stuff is for him. I have, you know, these, like, I, I gave him some of these recipes and just, you know, photograph stuff and put it on there. But, you know, no, no matter what you do, no matter what you say on there, there's always some idiot that's, like, somebody's good, has to come out of the weeds and be an asshole. You know? Yeah, that's true. That's social media. Posted, <laughs> yeah, but he posted something about an English breakfast, and there's some guy somewhere that's an expert on it, evidently, and he was annoyed by this. You know, it, 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 who needs this shit? Right. I mean, this is just, it's just, it's just right. aggravation. What are you going to do? You're going to get on there and argue with an idiot? You know? <laughs> just These people argue about politics. You know, they want to they kill each other. Who, who, who needs this shit? Yeah. So, so come on, guys. Have I have I uh, put you to sleep enough yet, or what? I, I appreciate. Look, no, I appreciate. Thank you so much for joining us. I look. I'm looking forward to this. We had a great time, and uh, like I said, I, I've been a big fan for many years, and I, I thank you for taking the time to speak today. Thank you, thank you very much, guys, and uh, uh, thank you for having me on. I had a lot of fun. No, this is great. this is great. We really appreciate it. Right. This has been Pop Culture okay. Retro with Jonathan Rosen and Ike Eisman. And again, a very special thanks to Tony Ganyos. And please subscribe. Thank you for listening to Pop Culture Retro, where no one was hurt during the making of this podcast. 